What's up, Hill City? So good to be with you this morning. This week, we are starting a brand new collection of messages called God Is, and these messages are going to be all about the names, the character, and the nature of God. And so we're going to jump right in, and I want to read to you from a passage in Romans, Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 15. The Apostle Paul says this, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. That's going to be really important for us in the rest of our time together. He says, you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and then fellow heirs with Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. We thank you for your word. God, I pray that uh, your heart would be communicated first and foremost today. Lord, that every word that comes out of my mouth would do its best to reflect your heart and what it is that you want your children to hear throughout the course of our time together. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I don't know if there's any other space nerds out there, but I love space and all things NASA. One of my favorite memories is getting to take my children to watch a SpaceX rocket launch while we were living in Florida. Um, April 24th, 1990, NASA launched it then what was the most powerful space telescope that they had ever created. And the big idea was this, it was supposed to be able to see from space what even the most powerful telescopes on Earth would never be able to see. Because the scientists say that looking at the galaxies from the Earth is at best like looking through a piece of dirty glass uh, or stained glass maybe even because you have to look through the atmosphere and that creates all kinds of distortion. So the big idea was this, let's create this telescope and Hubble was going to fly 360 miles above the surface of the Earth making a complete uh, lap around the Earth about every 96 minutes and it could see into the stars and galaxies. And it, the idea was it would take pictures and report back what it was finding. It cost about a billion and a half dollars, which is pretty expensive. And so they get Hubble up there and it's doing its thing. And finally, after some bit of time, it starts to send its first pictures back from space to the Earth. It was pretty slow, Wi-Fi is bad up in outer space. And so when the scientists on Earth started to get the pictures, they were horrified to see that the pictures they were getting were totally useless. They were so blurry and distorted. You can see an example right here. So it's time for these engineers to go back to the drawing board and they rechecked all of their work and they discovered a mistake when they designed the lens. Turns out that their billion and a half dollar telescope was nearsighted. So here's what they did. They built a huge for lack of a better way to describe it, contact lens, because the, the, this, this thing was nearsighted. And essentially they made a, a duplicate of the original lens, but they inverted it. And the idea was to slap this contact lens on and it would correct the pictures that were coming back to earth. And that's exactly how it worked. And you can see how now it was reporting pictures with total clarity. It's amazing, right? The difference from having the correct lens on. I've got a question for us today, church. And the question is this, is it possible that what we see every day is not everything that's there? Let me ask the question maybe just a little bit differently in a slightly different way. Is it possible that what you're seeing isn't incorrect, but maybe it's incomplete or distorted like the Hubble photos, more specifically as it relates to God? Is it possible that the way that you see him and therefore the way that you approach him every day because of your church upbringing, uh, your prayer life, books you've read, is it possible that maybe that's not everything that's meant to be there. And I would suggest that if we're honest and brave enough to answer that question with a yes, that that is a possibility, then it would be fair to say that, not that any of us has maybe an incorrect view of God, but that we have an incomplete view or a distorted view of God. And I can't help but believe or wonder that maybe that isn't uh, more than a few of us who are here listening to this message today. And here's the, the problem with that. The problem is, is that your incorrect or distorted view of God is affecting your relationship with him, how you see him and how you approach him. You know that old nursery rhyme, twinkle, twinkle, little star? Any parents out there remember singing that to their little ones? Well, that song, that nursery rhyme, you know that's actually a lie? Stars don't twinkle. Stars are steady and they're constant. They only appear to twinkle because of the distortion, the gas in the Earth's atmosphere. So again, what you're seeing and what you're experiencing isn't actually all that's there to be experienced. I'll ask the question again, is it possible that how we see and therefore how we're approaching God is not incorrect, but is it possible that it's incomplete, that it's distorted, that there's something interfering 
with your relationship with God. I know that that's been true for me in my life. I grew up in a church going home, Christian parents, Christian churches, Christian school, Christian college, invited Jesus into my heart at such a young age. And I was blessed to just be in environments where I got to learn so much about God, all these amazing characteristics that he's infinite, that he's omnipotent, he's all powerful, he's all knowing, omniscient, omnipresent, that he's everywhere all at one time, he's faithful, he's holy. See, I knew all these things about God, I knew a lot about God, but I'm not sure that I actually knew God. Do you understand the difference? Right? Like I knew his characteristics, but I didn't know maybe his identity. So my connection with him was incomplete. It was, it was distorted. I wasn't looking at him or approaching him with the right lens on. And the truth is, truth is this, y'all. The truth is that until you understand God's identity, you cannot experience him fully. And I remember a moment where I was reading this passage that we just read from Romans chapter 8. And as I was reading through the passage, it's like my eyes were opened and I began to see some things that I'd never seen before as I studied the passage and read it in some different translations and read some resources about it. And so I'm going to reread Romans 8 to you, but I'm going to read it the way that God kind of showed it to me that day. So I've layered in some of these different translations to add some emphasis for you because I think it'll bring some new revelation to you. Here's what it says with some emphasis added in Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery. That means of religious duty to fall back into fear, the fear of not being good enough, the fear of having to, to earn God's approval. But instead, you've received the spirit of adoption. That means full acceptance as sons and daughters. That means enfolded into the family of God so that you should never feel orphaned by whom we cry, Abba, Father, which means my daddy. And as I began to see these, this additional emphasis, this additional clarity, this revelation, my eyes were opened. It was like a corrective lens was being applied to my relationship with God as I studied that. Because I had an incorrect or incomplete view, perception of what it meant to relate to God. Listen, for years I had known Jesus and I had served God, but there was something incomplete. And the incomplete part was that I wasn't relating to or experiencing God as Father. Now, I knew He was Jesus' Father, but I didn't see him as my father. I saw him as God the Father, but not God my Father. And I think that that may be the case for a lot of us because for me, like, I had a father. So I didn't see the need to have a different father, to have God as a father. But I didn't have a Lord and Savior. So it was pretty evident pretty early on to me that I needed a Lord and Savior. So I needed Jesus. So Paul's writing Romans chapter 8, and he's writing to the early church in Rome. This is only like 20 or 25 years after the death of Jesus. So this is like really early on in the early church. And what we're seeing and what Paul's addressing is this drift in this church from relationship with a God that wants to be your father, this drift from that into religion. He's, so he's telling Christians, he's telling church people who are probably wrestling with some of the same things we wrestle with, Hey, you're trying to earn your acceptance, your affirmation, your approval to earn this uh, connection with God. You're fearful that you're on his bad side. And Paul says, you've got this all wrong. And so he introduces this concept of adoption to help the church in Rome to understand God's true identity. Now, here's what you need to know about adoption in the Roman culture in this context. And it's different than the Jewish culture where Jesus uh, performed most of his ministry. In the Jewish culture, there really was no process or need for adoption because biological relationships were permanent. You could not create an heir to your family from outside of your family bloodline. But in Roman culture, it was actually totally different. So that wasn't the case. Biological relationships, they weren't permanent. So Roman law, in contrast to Jewish law, actually allowed a man to create an heir to his family from outside of his bloodline. So a child who was born biologically to a family those parents had the option of disowning that child, and they might do that for a variety of reasons, right? Like maybe they couldn't afford to give that child a good life, or maybe they had exceeded the, the legal amount of, of children that they were allowed to have. But here's what they knew, these families that were going to have to give up a child. They knew that somewhere there was another family who needed a son to, contary, to carry on their family lineage. And that had huge like societal implications for them. I mean, there was inheritance implications, even religious implications for these Roman families. The idea was, though, that there was a great need for every family to have a healthy, high-functioning son to carry on and continue the family line. And so here's what that meant. That, would, that meant that a biological family might actually hang on to their kids until really like late in life and give them up for adoption uh, later on. And it almost created like a marketplace for sons. 
In fact, it wasn't uncommon for parents to give a son up for adoption that might be like in their 20s or 30s years of age. That's pretty crazy. That's really different than even we understand adoption to be right now. So what I'm saying is this, biologically in the Roman culture where Paul is writing this message, he says, where he says what he says in Romans 8, in that culture, the parent and child relationship, it just wasn't permanent not guaranteed, and in many cases, it wasn't even wanted. And, and that's really important context for us as we study. But here's what else was true in Roman culture about adoption. When a child was adopted into a new family, it was treated totally different than, uh, than a biological child. And that's so critical for us because Paul, in this letter, addressing this church who has shifted from relationship to religion, trying to earn God, he says, I'm going to draw a comparison of what God is like and who he wants to be. And he doesn't pick this heavenly, divine, cosmic being, source of all things to describe God. He picks the, 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 the illustration of God as an adoptive father. And he's saying, you're seeing this incompletely. I'm going to use this comparison because all of his audience would have understood, oh, adoption, here's what that means. And so in Roman culture, adoption was powerful for the adopted person and for the family. It was life-altering. It was a transformational event. And, I, and there's, there's a few things we want to pull from that, and I want to share with you three transformational truths of seeing God as your adoptive father. See, in Rome, parents without kids were so desperate to have somebody to carry on their family lineage and be carriers, reflections, image bearers, if you will, of the family heritage they might actually wait and look for years before they picked a son to adopt. They would wait and they would search because they, but they so deeply desired a child, they wanted to get it right. And in many cases, they searched so long and so hard. And as I said earlier, some of these families giving their children up for adoption would hold on to them to kind of see what they turned into. And a child might be 20 or 30 before they gave them up for adoption. So these adoptive families would actually be adopting what is we would consider to be an adult. And here's what that child, that person, or that young adult would know when they were being adopted. They would know that they were sought out, that they were freely chosen, and that they were fully desired by their adoptive parents. And, and Paul, using that illustration, wants us to know that that's true for us too as it relates to God. That you and I, that were freely chosen and fully desired by God. He wasn't under duress. He doesn't feel obligated. He created you to be his son and to be, to be his daughter. He fully desires relationship with you. You are fully chosen and fully desired by your adoptive father. That's so amazing. Like for some of us, you could stop the message right now because that alone will just shake you to your core if you embrace what that really means. But there's more we can learn from Roman adoption. The second transformational truth is this, that you are completely forgiven by God. When you're adopted into his family through Jesus, you are completely forgiven forgiven by God. Because the person being adopted in Roman culture, like I said, might be a young adult, they had some life behind them, they had some years behind them, here's what that meant. That meant they probably weren't an innocent child and they were bringing some baggage with them. Anybody have some baggage in their life? Anybody come to Jesus with some baggage in your life? I had baggage. I had baggage and carry-ons when I kind of began to understand this. Well, the same was true back then in these relationships. Many times the person being adopted might have debt or sometimes even a criminal record. But the adoptive parents, for whatever reason, would see something in that person and they would choose them freely and past, you know, the past baggage included, and they would choose to adopt them even in light of their sordid past. But Roman law had a provision. The provision would allow for the past of the adopting, the person that's being adopted to be completely wiped out. That meant any prior commitments, prior debt, prior responsibilities, prior obligations, even criminal records would be completely wiped out. It was as if the old person never even existed before. Now, of course, the Roman government wasn't charitable. That came at a steep price for the adopting family. But I think that's so similar to how it works for you and I. See, our complete forgiveness came at a great cost too. And that price that was paid for our forgiveness was Jesus. But do you see it? Like, can you imagine it? This illustration of adoption that Paul chooses, he, he chooses it of all the things you could choose to describe God. He says that this adoptive father is the best way to describe God to us. God is an adoptive father who not only chose us in our brokenness, but he also redeems us. That means he restores us to like new condition. He restores us to our original purposes. Think about what that means for you. That means that you don't have to carry your past with you because it's already been forgiven. As an adopted child, you are completely forgiven 
by your father. Here's the third transformational truth. You are completely and unconditionally loved by God. This may be the most important one. Remember earlier I said that, the, that in Roman culture, the biological relationships, they weren't permanent. But adoptive relationships were different in that culture. An adopted child or an adopted person would become a permanent part of that family. Think about that. A biological parent could give up a biological child into adoption, but an adopted child could never be given away from that family. That is mind-blowing to me. It's so different, but there's, I think there's such an important parallel for us in our relationship with God is him as our adoptive father. There's no undo button for the father's love in your life. That means that maybe your earthly father or some other father figure, maybe a pastor, a teacher, a boss, a voice of influence, they may have hurt you. They may have rejected you. They may have abandoned you. They may have walked out of your life, but it's not the same with your adoptive father your adoptive heavenly father. There is nothing you can do to make him love you anymore. And there is nothing that you've done that could cause him to love you less. Your father, he loves you. He won't undo, he can't undo the relationship that he's created with you as his son or as his daughter. There's no undo button on that. It's like the Roman adoption process. Here's why that con this concept of adoption is so critical to, to us and how we see God. It's really simple. We were all created to need love, relationship with God. God wanted relationship, to love us and to be loved by us. And we're created to receive that from God. But when we don't see him as father, it creates interference. It creates distortion or interference in the way that we receive his love, the way that we experience relationship with him. In fact, I would say that it distorts our relationship with him. Just like those pictures from the Hubble telescope. Is it possible that not seeing God as a father is holding you back from fully experiencing him. I've said a couple times, like it wasn't that I had an incorrect view of God, it was that I had an incomplete view of God. And the truth is when we don't connect to him as father, it interferes with us receiving the fullness of his love for us. In other words, you can't fully experience God's love without connecting to him as a father. When the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. He started what we now call, he recited what we now call the Lord's Prayer. And that prayer starts off by saying, Our Father. Father is God's favorite name. And when we don't see him and approach him like a father, it creates interference in receiving that love that he desires for us. When Hubble was sending back blurry pictures of galaxies far, far away, it wasn't the universe's fault. It had a lens problem. And that lens had to be corrected. So the question for you and for me to process today is, what lens are you looking at your relationship with God through? Is it the lens of slavery, fear of not being good enough, carrying around that, that, that sense that I have to earn God's approval or religious duty, I have to do good things for him or else he'll get mad at me? Or do you have the lens of a, a son or a daughter, the lens that reminds your heart that you were freely chosen and that you're fully desired, that you're completely forgiven, and that you're unconditionally loved. And when you put the right lens on, it changes everything because it allows the fullness of his light and love to come into your life. Adoption, this idea of adoption or sonship, daughtership, it can only be received through Jesus and it can only be rejected, but it can't be earned. Some of us have been trying to earn attention or approval from God. Some of us are holding on to something in our past that God let go of a long time ago. Some of us came in today questioning if God still loves you. I can tell you emphatically that if you have made the decision to follow Jesus, then you need to know that you're freely chosen and fully desired, that you're completely forgiven, and that you are permanently and unconditionally loved. And if you haven't yet made that decision to follow Jesus, then it could just be that God's inviting you to do that today, that he's inviting you into that adoptive relationship today. And your group leader will know how to talk to you about that. In fact, it's gonna be the first question you guys are gonna spend some time discussing. And I would just encourage you, if that's you, to receive the Father's love today through the sacrifice, the price that Jesus paid. It was a pleasure being with you all today. I'm gonna to turn it over to your group leaders. They've got some discussion questions and I'm believing that you're gonna have some powerful, powerful discussion as you kick this message around a little bit. 
Thanks, everybody. Love you.